Life on Earth is diverse. A million species have been named. Perhaps a million more wait to be discovered. Possibly there have been two billion species since life began. For every species, life is a struggle against great odds. The environment fluctuates through a wide range of conditions. Humans survive in extremes, ranging from minus 40 degrees to an incredible plus 110 degrees Celsius. All organisms are equipped for coping with changes like these. Homeostasis is about coping. Coping may look easy on the outside, but on the inside, it's all happening. Sensing, reporting, and responding. All under constant control. For example, a dog responds to cold by causing its fur to stand away from the skin, trapping more warm air. This skimpy fur of humans does the same, which produces goosebumps. Another response is shivering, which generates heat in the muscles. Too much heat, on the other hand, provokes a different response, panting, which evaporates water from the tongue and lungs, in turn cooling the blood. Other factors also must be carefully controlled. Blood sugar provides energy to cells. Most organisms can't eat constantly to provide a steady flow of sugar. So the body must balance storage and release of glucose into the blood, whether during inactivity or even the wildest activity. A pioneer in the study of an organism's control processes, Claude Bernard, proposed in 1859 that every organism exists in two environments, the external environment and the internal environment. He proposed that all vital mechanisms have only one object, to preserve constant conditions of life in the internal environment, what Bernard called le milieu intérieur. In 1930, American Walter Cannon gave the process a name, homeostasis. Homeo, the same. Stasis, standing still. In other words, preserving a steady state in the internal environment. In fact, a steady state is approached but never quite achieved. Record your body temperature from minute to minute. And the result looks something like this. Again, over a longer time period. Why these fluctuations? Consider how a thermostat controls the temperature of your home. Cool air causes a temperature drop. This closes a switch. An electric signal is sent to the furnace, which responds by sending warm air. Eventually, the thermostat senses the change and switches off the furnace. Between switch on and switch off is a small interval usually about three degrees Celsius. So our home temperature fluctuates up and down, like our body temperature. And just as we can turn the thermostat up, the body can choose a higher set point suitable for fighting a virus. About this new set point, homeostasis still maintains a narrow fluctuation. Different organisms maintain different set points. Bird temperatures fluctuate about a set point of 42 degrees Celsius. 
but not all organisms can control their temperatures. As the temperature of the environment rises, the temperature of the frog also rises. A graph comparing the two temperatures looks like this. An organism whose temperature varies with that of the surroundings is called poikilothermic. Birds and mammals respond differently. Organisms which produce a graph like this are called homeothermic. The same graph shape describes many other factors controlled by homeostatic mechanisms. For example, water intake compared to total body water. Or sodium intake compared to sodium in the blood. An overload on the mechanism of homeostasis produces these slopes. The plateau is the range where mechanisms of homeostasis effectively control the internal environment. These mechanisms follow a general pattern. A stress acts on an organism. It is detected by a receptor. The receptor sends a message to a control center where the stress is evaluated. The control center selects one of several possible responses and sends a message to an effector. The effector causes a response to the stress. Usually, there is a final step. The effector sends feedback to the receptor to turn it off or reset it. Receptor, control center, effector, feedback. Consider a simple single-celled organism, euglena. It converts sunlight to energy in chloroplasts. For euglena, light is a stress, which stimulates an eye spot that acts as a receptor. The control center for this stimulus is still poorly understood. The nucleus could receive molecular messages from the eye spot and interpret them. Even the chloroplasts are capable of performing this function. But it's quite likely that the control center is the eye spot itself, which is sensitive only to certain wavelengths of light, matching the needs of the chloroplasts. The eye spot may send a nerve-like message through the strands of the flagellum. The effector is the flagellum, which acts like a propeller, pulling the euglena through the water of a pond towards the life-giving light. It's possible that feedback is a nerve-like pulse from the flagellum, allowing its motion to be coordinated. This general model, receptor, control center, effector, and feedback is a useful tool for the further study of homeostasis. <laughs> Thank you.